Hi, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us in our session. Uh, we will talk about simple things, so apparently war and peace. Uh, we will um, try to solve um, critical questions, I think, to the f of the future of the internet in our hour and a bit. Um, and we will have a little short interventions at the beginning for each of our panelists, um, and then sort of have a discussion as well as open uh, the questions to the audience. Um, so hopefully this will be an exciting uh, conversation and stimulate debate. Um, the, I will start uh, with Hugo. Um, who is a cyber fellow at the School of International and Public Stud Studies in Colombia. Um, and um, he will try to paint a picture of uh, some of the challenges that we face today in the, and in the next few years as I think a global society, um, challenges that relate to government action in cyberspace. And I think he won't start from the necessary the offensive perspective, which I think a lot of our panel will sort of seek to tackle, but we'll look at how some of the policy decisions, some of them as a result of offensive actions, are um, driving the future of the internet. Thanks, Nadia. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Um, so I have the hard task of uh, presenting the, the, the challenges of war and peace in the digital age. Uh, small uh, small uh, intervention. Uh, but thanks everyone for being here. Thanks to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me to this panel. And uh, an introduction, I also note that uh, some of my remarks uh, will be extracted from uh, a paper we, we published with uh, Nicholas Ott and it's available in uh, in the digital debate, so if you don't have your copy, run after the panel to get it. Um, I'll try not to repeat myself, but to extract uh, some of the policy proposals that we, that we make in the paper. Um, so I'll say uh, very briefly three things. The first is that uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity to, uh, to, to prevent uh, unnecessary escalation of cyber conflict through uh, uh, modernizing the international institutions. Um, then the second thing I'll, I'll argue is that uh, a lot of the security threats that we face are still dealt with in, in our system at the national level, not the international level. And the third thing is uh, that in fact, managing uh, this, uh, this mismatch, this national versus international level, uh, which drives internet fragmentation, might help us better manage cyber conflict at the same time. So to start with the first point, um, the panel is called War and Peace, and I'm going to start by, uh, by arguing that, uh, in fact, it's not you know, a binary uh, war and peace uh, world we live in, but we live in a world of conflict. And so instead of thinking about it at zeros and ones, I'm an engineer, I like to think about, about things in zeros and ones, but, uh, but in this case, uh, I think it's useful to, to, to have the word conflict in mind. And uh, I work at Columbia, and as one of my colleagues, Jay Healy, uh, says very often, which I think is, is one of uh, the most important remarks is the cyber conflict uh, might be the most escalatory type of conflict uh, that we know. And so in fact, uh, what we want to do to prevent fallout war is manage uh, escalatory dynamics uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this cyber conflict uh, world we live in. So there, there are, of course, uh, many ways to do that. But the question is, how do we build the international institutions that are able to uh, de-escalate cyber conflict when it starts? There are many ways to do that again. Uh, uh, Karsten uh, here uh, will probably say that the GGE, in fact, is one way, or could say, uh, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, uh, could say that perhaps the GGE is one of the ways we could do this because it's a significant way that states can interact uh, and explain their actions uh, in cyberspace uh, to each other and, and, and their intentions. Uh, the Global Commission on, uh, on the Stability of Cyberspace uh, might be another, uh, another uh, aspect uh, where it's a mechanism uh, through which uh, cons consensus can be reached on what's uh, perhaps acceptable and not acceptable in cyberspace. Confident building measures more likely, more, more, uh, more generally. And if we talk about the dig digital Geneva Convention, well, maybe that's another, uh, maybe that's another way we can, uh, we can uh, uh, have uh, states and other, uh, other stakeholders interact in order to de-escalate cyber conflict. Okay, so now, 
what are, how do we build uh, international institutions able to, to de-escalate these types of cyber conflict? And the problem is that citizens still look at their national authorities to protect them from security threats. Uh, of course, uh, where after the last couple of days, we could uh, take the example of, of Las Vegas, which is a tragic incident. I'm from France, and so uh, I vividly remember the, the Paris attacks. Um, and um, in the wake of, of, the, of the Paris attacks, uh, a, lot of, a lot of citizens were really looking to the national government, the French government, not, not the international institutions, to protect them for future threats. And this is very natural. Uh, it's a very natural reaction. Uh, and in fact, in the wake of, of, the, of the Paris attacks, they are aware a couple of new, of new laws being passed in France to, to try and address uh, this security, security threat. Now, of course, some argue that uh, the new laws uh, about, a, uh, about surveillance de loi renseignement uh, is the result of a security establishment gone, gone mad, and, 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 uh, and, and many NGOs have been, have been fighting those in court. Um, and you could also argue that, that, in fact, these laws are the result of people being afraid and the government simply doing its job of, uh, of answering that, uh, that, 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 that fear um, and people wanting, in fact, their governments to, to be more, uh, more proactive into, uh, into answering their, their concerns. And so to a certain extent, both of these are true. Uh, but, but as this example shows, this is a clear example where there's a mismatch between the national and the international level. People look to the national level uh, to, to, to take measures, but then they're not coordinated at the international level. And so in the paper we published uh, with, with Nicholas, uh, and I'll leave you with this, um, we offer the idea that uh, one of the things we could do to limit that is uh, write uh, fragmentation impact assessments. And the idea there is uh, to help uh, us together think about um, the consequences of policies be being taken at, an, at a national level. Um, we uh, think tanks and, and, and other uh, ac academia could take, the, take on the task to take sort of specific policies and write in a structured way fragmentation impact assessments so we understand what kind, types of policies are uh, really not interoperable with other, other uh, states and where it matters most. Uh, and this is to be able to have a more nuanced, nuanced debate about internet fragmentation. Not only you know, all internet fragmentation is good or all internet fragmentation is bad, but this is a type of fragmentation that is most harmful to the interoperability of the international system, and so this is how we should deal with it. Uh, so just to conclude, another way of looking at internet fragmentation in the light of what I just said is that in fact internet fragmentation is the byproduct of states fearing the escalation of cyber conflict, and I think this is um, useful to keep in mind. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, I think there, I, there's, there are a couple points I, I kind of want to pick on and sort of throw over to Kirsten, I think, um, which is um, I, I, I like, you know, the, how you painted the fact that cyber could potentially be looked at as a way to de-escalate conflict. Like, but in reality, it's also a way for conflict to magically blown all, to be blown all over, um, all out of control, sorry. Um, and I think um, finding ways to deal with what is a national security issue and sort of manage it at an international level um, has, has been challenging. Um, and I want to see if Carson wants to talk a little bit about the sort of the work in this space done by in international organizations, by governments so far, and sort of whether there are any challenges or issues uh, that are preventing us from moving forward in this space. <clears throat> yeah, I think the answer to that question is 42. <laughs> um, uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much for, for asking, thank, uh, allowing me to pick up on what uh, Hugo said, and, and, and I would also like to uh, just uh, present the word of thank you to the organizers of Sci-Fi that have done once again a stellar job at organizing a really, really interesting conference. Now, picking up on, on what Hugo said, um, uh, you've, you've, you were talking about the need to uh, 
to modernize existing international institutions. And that's been going on, I think, uh, for a number of years um, at various levels. Uh, let me maybe zero in on one um, that, may, that, that may be most uh, interesting uh, at, at this moment, which is uh, the work that's been going on at the United Nations uh, in the so-called Group of Government Experts, the, the GGE. Um, so the background against that, uh, the background of that is that in 1998, um, the Russians came to the UN and said, uh, we need to talk about information security. And most people at the United Nations said, um, what have you been smoking? Um, like, could you share that with us? Um, but the Russians kept insisting that this is important. And so um, the United Nations did what, what the UN does, uh, what any good institution does when it doesn't when it's faced with an issue and doesn't know how to take this forward, it uh, convened a working group uh, to study the issue. Um, that working group is called a group of government experts. And um, so there was one convened in 2004, which met, uh, was composed of, I think, 15 experts coming from various countries. And it met um, three times for a week, and then uh, they couldn't come to an agreement. Um, so the Russians said this is important and kept insisting. And so in, in 2009, another such group was convened. And that one actually after, in 2010, so after only 12 years of negotiations, issued a report saying, we do have a problem. Um, it did a little more than that. Um, it, it said, or it also said, and, and we may take a number of steps to address this program. This problem, but the real the real gist of the 2010 report was the recognition in the United Nations that um, ICT information communication technology can present a risk to public safety and uh, to the international community as a whole. So um, then um, another one of these expert groups was convened, um, which in 2013, after only 15 years now, again calculating from the start after 2015 years uh, arrived at a real breakthrough, which was to say, ICT does present a problem to international peace and security, and international law applies, and in particular the UN Charter applies. Um, so what, uh, what I'm trying, trying to tell you here is that this is a, a process that has been going on for a number of years, and the, the, the progress is, uh, as any progress in a global institution is uh, much slower than you would wish for. Anyway, um, there were two more of these experts groups convened, the one in 2014, 2015, um, presented a very substantive report um, with the number of recommendations included for, uh, for non-binding norms of responsible state behavior. Um, and everybody since has been, has been hopping down, up and down with excitement saying norms are the thing. Um, but the GGE also presented a number of, of very interesting uh, suggestions on how existing international law applies to state use of information communication technologies. And um, because the, there was a feeling that we should, we should delve deeper into the issue, um, another expert group was convened in 2016 and 2017. That one picked up on the work done by the previous GGEs and it met um, uh, through June of this, this year and then on June 23rd of this year after really good and substantive negotiations or talks um, and um, a lot, where a lot of progress had been made, the group found out that it could not arrive at a consensus report. Um, you know, to put this into perspective, um, there was about, I, the, the overwhelming majority of, of the points that the group had been discussed were ripe for consensus. I mean, it wasn't the ideal, um, every, every, anybody's ideal that the group had arrived at, but everybody said, we can, we can agree to this, except for one element of the group's mandate, and that was um, specific aspects of how existing international law applies. This turned out to be really, really difficult. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, it, it became clear that also issues of, of fact, um, you know, questions of, of uh, technology became interspersed with, the, with the, legal, the purely legal issues, and it, be, it was impossible to get out of that. So the group had to report to the Secretary General, sorry, Mr. Secretary General, we cannot arrive at consensus, which is not 
what uh, uh, made the members of that expert group heroes in the eyes of the international community. Um, so the question is where to, where to take things from here. Um, again, in the spirit of views, uh, question of how do we modernize existing international institutions. Um, I think there's a number of, of proposals out there. Um, you could have another one of these expert groups, another one of these GGEs. Um, uh, the problem with that is, is that um, if the last one couldn't agree, then what gives, fills us with the optimism that a new one could, uh, could arrive at a different outcome. Um, you could give the issue to uh, the International uh, Disarmament Commission. Um, there's uh, a number of pros for that, um, but there's also a couple of drawbacks. One issue is that the, the, the Disarmament Commission uh, only covers a very limited ish number of issues every year. Um, another issue is that um, giving it to the Disarmament Commission would mean recognizing that we actually have an arms control, a disarmament issue at our hand. And I'm not, not sure that the international community is there, is ready to, to, to accept that. And the same logic also holds for giving the issue to the International Conference on Disarmament, which meets in Geneva. Um, plus, uh, the Conference on Disarmament has been unable to agree a work program for the last 20 years, so that might not be the most uh, promising venues. Um, so any, any number of, of ideas are out there. One that's been put forward is to have an open-ended working group. Open-ended working group is, is kind of a, a, um, a body that the UN General Assembly creates um, where all interested states can participate in a discussion and it's unlimited um, in, its, uh, in its proceedings. Um, so the advantage of that is it's very inclusive, it has a lot of, uh, of legitimacy. The disadvantage of that is it starts with ambassadors and ministers making important pronouncements, not announcement, pronouncements, and um, then uh, interns continuing to meet and discussing those. Um, so an open-ended working group is not the most efficient uh, way forward. Um, one group, um, and here I'm really transgressing my authority, but one idea that the, the last GGE did discuss um, and that I think had a good chance of making it into the final report if we hadn't stumbled over this question of how existing international law applies. One proposal that's out there is to have, a, to have the General Assembly establish a committee on ICT use and um, have the meetings of that committee preceded by consultations with the wider UN membership. Um, that's a very nice idea because it allows for, for inclusiveness, right? Um, you have the, the consultations with the wider UN membership. It allows for bringing in other stakeholders because you could actually include those in the consultation process. Uh, yet a committee could have a limited membership um, the members of that committee would, could rotate, could be, or would be elected by the, the General Assembly, so you have all this legitimacy uh, taken care of. It would be expert driven, um, because you have a small number of members. Uh, and um, it, you could write into the mandate of such a, a committee that it has to continue working on the basis of consensus. Um, so in, in, in my assessment, it, it, it ticks all the boxes. Um, I do believe that it might be, if you want to carry on uh, in this direction, it might be best at this point to, to uh, uh, take a step back and not ask such a group to, or such a committee to continue carrying the work further, but rather at this point to review where we are, what uh, we have achieved, what, and, and to work on that basis. And if I were to have it my way, I would split off the extremely controversial and technical issues of how existing international law applies and give them to an expert body, which could be, for instance, the Sixth Committee, the International Law Committee of the General Assembly, or the International Law Commission, um, but split the legal issues off the, the very practical issues that uh, both need to be treated, but maybe having them, uh, maybe, maybe unpackaging them uh, might be uh, a possible way forward. Um, that's, um, I think, where I want to stop at this point, Kaya. Okay, thank you. That, that was 
I think, a lot of ideas out there. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and also, I always like it when diplomats are skeptical about how slow things, how much time things take, because I think thinking about what happened in 2004, um, that when the first GG uh, convened, and sort of from the technology perspective, I feel that we didn't have iPads yet. And I don't think anyone has iPads anymore. Uh, so, you, but I think we moved on. The, oh, uh, but I think, um, so, so, so the pace of change, I think, has been dramatic around the UNGG. I think with that, I wanna sort of go over to Elaine and sort of, Carson talk, touched about, the international, about international law. He also was somewhat skeptical about the idea of norms. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Do I want to comment? Hello? Hello? Okay. It works. Do I want to comment on that very question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, Carson laid out very nicely sort of all the institutional options of going forward. I think what I would like to do is tag on a layer on that and make it a bit more abstract and going forward looking at all those diff different options, what's happened, what's going to happen now in a post-GGE world in a sense. I just want to uh, throw out three concerns or three broad trend lines that I see that will have to be addressed in no matter what's going forward. And one is that uh, the GGE this year didn't come up with a report. Um, so that's where we stand. But we still have the GGE reports from 2013 and 2015. So I think part of the attention now um, will be on that consensus and implementing that consensus. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit later about other initiatives that are going on, about how to actually push forward with, the, with those implementation efforts, whether to give them to regional intergovernmental organizations or whether to turn those into more um, multi-stakeholder efforts that brings in different parties to think about how can we um, flesh out what those um, arguably high-level norms that were agreed on in the GG, what do they actually look like and how can we make them work in practice? The second um, trend line that I see is um, this trend of opening up the conversation and that is in two respects. One is that the GGE and the whole norms and international law debate right now has still been relatively small. There is a small group of countries that are um, well versed in these issues and that have had sort of the luxury to be able to care about these issues and I think going forward there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of capacity building to bring a lot more of the broader UN membership into this conversation and bring them into this conversation in a way where they can meaningfully engage in these issues. And the second strand of opening up this conversation is the question of bringing in other stakeholders. So this idea of bringing multi-stakeholderism to the international security debate, I think that's where it's going to get very interesting with the difference between international law and norms. I do tend to agree with uh, um, Karsten's point on giving the international law question to a more specialized body. But I think then it's also going to be very interesting to see the tension because international law is made by countries for countries. Whereas if you look at norms and the theories, the academic theory is theories about norms, um, a whole broad range of stakeholders can be norm entrepreneurs and can um, advocate for norms. And then those norms in turn can apply to um, vastly different audiences. They Elaine. can apply to states, they can apply to Elaine. individual can users. Can I actually ask you something? Can you yes. explain to the audience what a norm is? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, but you know, try. <laughs> Or Karsten's volunteering. <laughs> can, can, can I take this from you? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, norms are table manners. I would right? say expected sets of behavior. Okay. Well, a, a table manner is an expected set of behavior. Um, so they're not binding, but um, states are supposed to adhere to them, to respect them. Um, you can think about it this way. Um, there's probably no country in the world that has a rule that you have to that has a law, I'm sorry, that has a law that if you're sitting at the dinner table, you have to chew with your mouth closed. Um, but in most ca families in, the, in this world, if, uh, if the children at the t dinner table do chew with, your, with their mouth open, um, uh, the mood becomes somewhat tense. And that's what a norm is. Um, you know, uh, there's no, there are certain issues on which there are no international laws that pertain to how states uh, on things uh, states should be doing, 
but they're, they're good ideas of what responsible state behavior uh, could be, especially uh, with regard to ICT use. And, and the, 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 the GGE in 2014, 2015 tried to make the differentiation between the binding international law that applies to state use of ICTs and then those non-binding ideas of what would be good responsible state behavior with, uh, uh, with regard to state use of these, these capabilities. So think of norms as table manners. That's actually very helpful. Elaine, sorry I interrupted you, but back to you and your point around norms and international law. So norms and international law, so in the sense, so what I'm trying to bring across is that there is a, a difference, it might be a nebulous difference, and for uh, I think many observers in this debate, they haven't really um, put a lot of clarity around these issues, but I think when we go forward, especially when we talk about splitting international legal questions from the non-binding political uh, commitments that are that have been called norms in the GGE reports is going to be important to make that distinction because at the end of the day um, diplomats and foreign ministries have also been very clear in saying that if there is talk about negotiating um, or clarifying international law it's going to be the states that decide about it they will take uh, sort of council and they will have open consultations um, bringing in proposals but at the end of the day those actors that are in the room making those decisions are, inter are states because states make international law at the end of the day. Uh, and then, so that was my second point of that this, this discussion is going to be broadened. One um, way in terms of the states that are going to be brought into this and then also outside of the governmental regime sort of the other stakeholders um, that will be participating in a much broader debate. Uh, the third point that I wanted to raise was with all these different initiatives, these, all these different venues and stakeholders involved, I think there's the challenge of overall coherence um, that we'll have to look out for because one um, risk that I see is a fragmentation. We've already seen that on a governmental level. We have Russia and China have had in the Shanghai Corporation Organization, they've had an international treaty on information security. They have um, submitted their codes of their proposals for a code of conduct in the UN several times we see the London process, we see other um, Western efforts in this area, and then when we layer on top of that the regional organizations that have become active in this field, ASEAN, OSCE, many more, and then on top of that the civil society engagements, I think there, is the, there are a lot of things going on, and for me one of the values of the UNGG process or having this in the UN uh, discussed is also to keep some sort of to keep the top layer there to make sure that in some way on the broadest sense possible all those efforts are converging hopefully and not diverging too much so that's the last challenge I see going forward the coherence question to really make sure that all those different efforts that will presumably start or develop or evolve that they don't uh, diverge too much thank you um, and I think I will keep going down the line. So I will ask Jane uh, to, to see whether, um, you know, as a commissioner on the Global Commission on Cyberspace, uh, that's sort of, I think, one of the venues that's been uh, proposed to sort of help drive this discussion forward. Um, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on uh, the direction of travel in this space and also on some of the points that Elaine just made around possible uh, lack of convergence, basically. So, thanks. I'm going to begin my remarks by reflecting on the title of the panel, which is War and Peace in Cyberspace. I spent the first half of my adult life as a soldier in my nation's army. I did my doctoral work at Stanford and wrote about how wars end, why they end when they do, why they don't end sooner. I spent a number of years as a peacekeeper in the United Nations, and I also was the executive director of a project on preventing violent conflict, the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Violent Conflict. So I think a lot about war and peace. I've also spent a lot of time recently um, over the past, I don't know, half dozen or more years on the whole question of cybersecurity and cyberspace and the growing changes to our everyday lives. And so I want to talk about war and peace in the digital age, war and peace today. Um, and I want some say that there's a new Cold War emerging. And I think there's some evidence to that. Uh, every government who is spending at all on cyber is spending multiple times as much 
on their military's cyber capabilities as they are on any civilian cyber capabilities. But I don't want to talk about a new Cold War. I want to talk about old war and the lessons it has for us today. I think there are several. The first lesson that old war has for us is that our vocabulary is inadequate to the challenges we're facing. In old war, we talk about ethnic conflict or religious conflict. That gives us no clue at all as to why these conflicts are violent. It tells us a little bit about why people are different, why they might disagree, but it doesn't tell us, those words don't tell us anything about why people are killing each other over their differences. The second thing I would say is that we know in old war that there are no straight lines. Every fist fight does not lead to nuclear confrontation. But at the same time, small acts can have big consequences. I think that's a clear lesson for cyberspace today. Third lesson is that our weapons no longer limit our ability to destroy things. Our weapons no longer limit our ability to destroy. In the olden days, arrows shot only so far, rifles only shot so far, but today we live in a world where the only thing standing between us and the precipice is our judgment. And the final lesson I think I would toss out, although I think there are many, many more, is that if you're going to think about war and how to prevent it, whether it's in physical space or cyberspace, you need a theory of the case. Why are people killing each other over their differences? Because for most conflicts, they are not. So what happens? Hugo mentioned the possibility for unconstrained escalation in cyber confrontations. That possibility also exists in many physical world as well. So what's your theory of the case? Why do people kill each other? Why do some conflicts erupt in mass violence and others not? And I think there are, the, my, I, I'll offer my own theory. I think it's the coincidence of two sets of factors. On the one hand, you have a population that is susceptible to being led to a fight. What are those attributes of susceptibility? The intersection of discrimination and deprivation. It is not the case that poor people kill each other only. Rich people will kill each other too. It's not simply the case that uneducated people will kill each other. Well-educated people will kill each other too. It's the intersection of deprivation and discrimination. I am unjustly being deprived. And when that set of factors coincides with a leader determined to have a fight, you will have a fight, whether you're rich or poor, powerful or not. It doesn't make them necessarily bad leaders. It just makes the difference between a riot and a systematic campaign of slaughter. So how do you prevent this kind of violence from erupting? And what does the dawn of the digital age, what is the existence of our enormous capacity in cyberspace say for all of these issues that we know to be so true, not in the distant past, but today, in today's world as well? If you want to prevent violence from breaking out, what do you need to do? If you want to prevent violence from spreading, what must you do? And if you want to prevent the resumption of violence after a peace has been achieved, what must be done? And how can we harness the power of the digital age in each of those three challenges? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that made me think like, several things that I think kind of want to touch upon as we go for forward through the discussion, I think, including um, sort of the, you mentioned how, the, how much governments are spending on offensive capabilities in cyberspace versus how much are they spending necessary on defensive capacities in cyberspace. I think the, um, and that's a scary prospect. <laughs> um, I think the other issue that um, would be interesting to sort of unpack as we go forward, and I think maybe touches a little bit on Elaine's point around multi-stakeholder involvement, is I think sometimes I feel in cyberspace, uh, states don't necessarily know the effect that uh, something they do would have, right? And how, where, where, where is, there, is that where um, there is a role for the private sector that might help, like might so, help? Yeah. So I just want to make one, one point of clarification. I didn't say states were spending more money on offense than defense. I said they're spending more money and investing okay. more money in the capabilities of their militaries than they are in their civilian space. Yeah. Point one. <clears throat> point two to your second point. I think we're, we are, witnessed um, the fact that governments have lost the corner on the market in three key areas that used to define their exceptionalism. 
the control of lethality, the control of capital, and the control of rulemaking. And that's true in physical space, and I think those effects are only magnified in cyberspace as well. Yeah, I think, I, I think those also, uh, that's actually true, and um, also concerning, I think, for the value of democracy uh, going forward, if you think, especially the, the last point about rulemaking going forward. But I think with, with your points, I kind of wanted to, t uh, to, sur to turn to Dennis and see um, you know, how do we protect some of the, um, the critical, I guess, uh, infrastructure that we have and so where we, um, in a world where we are all connected and increasingly and completely reliant. So how do we protect some of those assets and how do we make sure that governments understand the value of not attacking those assets. <coughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Not yet. No, not yet. Maybe now. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me here, and it's uh, it's always a, a jubilee honor to be the last in the panel because you hear so much input and you want to sort of weave it into what you thought you were going to say. <laughs> so um, let, let's see how I do. Um, I want to start from, uh, from, a, from a Dutch perspective in this case. Um, I work for an organization called the Scientific Council of Government Policy, and in 2015 uh, I wrote a report uh, at that institution called The Public Core of the Internet. And in that report is basically a plea for a norm, and I want to sort of trace that, uh, that, that norm a little and then come to where we are in the post-GGE world. Um, that norm is about, like you said, it's about uh, trying to protect establishing a norm of non-intervention in, in the core internet infrastructure, the core logical and to some extent physical infrastructure of the internet. So everything you need for your internet to function, whether you be in China, India, the United States or Germany, doesn't matter. You need the core forwarding and the core uh, uh, routing uh, uh, and naming protocols. You need that to function. That is sort of where we came to a norm saying, okay, we need to establish a norm that protects the core forwarding and routing functions and naming functions of the internet. Um, but that's not the basic idea. What, what happened with that report is that it got taken up by the Dutch government who made it uh, one of their policy priorities. Um, they made it an entry into the debates at the UNGGE. Um, uh, there was some discussion about it. Some of it may have made it, some of it may not have made it. We will never completely know because we don't know what's in the report. But interestingly, parallel to that, and my uh, neighbor can confirm this, parallel to that also the Global Commission uh, uh, on the uh, Stability of Cyberspace also has taken up the idea of the public core of the internet, put out a call for research on it, and is deliberating on it and trying to see, okay, what does, what it, where is this helpful? So how does this help us? And I, I hear they're coming out with something uh, on this uh, quite soon. Um, and that's an interesting uh, mixture because where does that leave us in, in a post-GGE world? And, uh, two of the, I think you're both lawyers, Carson and, uh, and Elaine, uh, they were talking about who do we give the issue to? And I think that's not always appropriate. It's because it's also an issue that can be appropriated. So it's not just who do we give it to? International law, yes. That is something that needs to be given to, to, an, to, an, to an institution that has the authority to actually do this, but that does not necessarily hold for, uh, for a norms process, which is a bar below that. And in a post-GGE world, um, it doesn't mean that the norms process stops. It doesn't for effect. I mean, it's already going on in many, many venues. Um, but there's three sorts of venues that have also been sort of circulating in the days that we were here, people uh, uh, pointing in certain directions that I would like to uh, sort of light up a little. Uh, one thing is people saying, okay, we should take it to the regional level. So the regional organizations, they should talk about norms. And that is actually uh, to a certain extent also uh, uh, combining with, with Jane about conflict, um, many of the conflicts that are now also cyber conflicts get tacked on to existing tensions between countries, existing conflicts between countries. Um, some of them are global, but many of them are not. So actually trying to figure out rules of the road for responsible state behavior and, and, and confidence building measures at a regional level in many places may be a very good idea and a good way to start thinking about norms. Um, another one that we hear a lot about is, okay, UNGG sort of crashed on, on, a, on a big issue. Maybe we should go talk 
uh, just with the like-minded states. That is basically saying, okay, we're going to talk with our friends. And the beauty of it is that there's still enough between friends to say, okay, what do we need to do and how do we flesh it out exactly? But in the end, you're like-minded states. And as Chris Painter said yesterday, so the easy norms bit may be over, but on the other hand, we're also responsible to spread the norms debate much wider. We need to engage a, large, a much larger group of countries into these debates and talking with your friends, talking with like-minded states, valuable though it is, is not a substitute for that. So where does that leave us? Um, and then there's multi-stakeholder. Um, for example, in a commission like the Global Commission on uh, Stability of Cyberspace, where you have people who were in governments or are government related but are not actually in government anymore, people from the technical community, NGOs, academia, uh, hawks in it, doves in it. Uh, so you get a very interesting uh, uh, combination of people in there. And as, uh, as Lovma Reddy said yesterday, these are people that do not have to defend national positions anymore. Uh, so they don't have to do it. Obviously, they're aware of it. Obviously, it shapes the way they're they in the debate, but they don't have to defend that position. That gives them a little more leeway to talk differently about it, and that may lead you to, uh, to interesting uh, perspectives. And the last one that has been sort of floating around um, um, is maybe we should also uh, uh, invest in coalitions of smaller states to the exclusion of the large states like the United States, like China, like Russia, uh, uh, to see what you can establish at a lower level. And the fact that these countries are not in the room physically does not mean that these countries will not be in the room as a specter, because they will. Smaller states will always take into account what is going on with other players. Um, but that may actually be uh, uh, another way of trying to find uh, 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 norms, trying to talk about norms that may get blocked or just sort of even blackballed in, in a different context where the big powers are at stake as well. Um, so concluding, I would say the norms process is a multi-fora uh, process. So it's not a zero-sum game. It's not if the UNGG does it, then nobody else can do it. And we know this. I mean, it's already going on. This is not a new thing. And the other thing is, in the end, it will have to resurface at a much higher level. It will have to resurface at the UN level. Uh, in what kind of form, I don't know. Carson has given interesting suggestions. Um, uh, but that is not necessarily for next year or the year after. Let's leave it at that for now. Thank you. Um, so I have several questions. I think uh, one, of, one of them I'm going to throw over to the lawyers, I think, for the clarification's uh, sake, which is, um, I think, you know, the title of the panel is War and Peace. Um, and I, I think there are several different layers of law that might apply. Uh, there's armed conflict, there's international law, there's also different activities. There's actual war activities where cyber is part of that. And, they, and there's activities that, which are much, much more frequent that happen outside the context of war. Um, so how, how, how does that kind of play into the norms legal ed slash legal process? Go ahead. Um, how does that play into the process? I think, um, so my first reaction would be, I think there has been a focus on the war aspect. There has been, first I agree with the Hugo's comment in the beginning, um, viewing it binary as war and peace, I think we've seen with the incidents that that's not as easy, um, but unfortunately that's how public international work international law works now. There's the threshold of armed conflict. That's when the Geneva Convention's kicking. That's when we're in the realm of international humanitarian law. And outside of that, we have all these other areas of public international law that govern everyday relations between states, that govern you getting a visa somewhere, that governs me getting a visa to India, going to the consulate or the embassy, um, to sending a letter, if you still do that these days. Um, or taking a plane. All those things are governed by international law. But I think, unfortunately, for the debate, there's been this focus on, this excessive focus, maybe on um, the humanitarian law and the armed conflict side of things. Um, whereas there's a lot of things happening, b what we, and, and legally, uh, in legal jargon, call below the threshold of use of force. Um, 
And I think the talent manual sort of tried to shift that or to, to pick up on that um, focus on the armed conflict side. Um, many of you might be aware, but there was the first iteration of the talent manual, which is an endeavor by international, by a group of international scholars, international lawyers to um, put down sort of the first benchmark of this is amongst our deliberations, this is where we come out of, this is how we think international law applies in cyberspace. And the first town manual was focused on international law and the use of force and international humanitarian law. And then there was a big debate saying, well, this is only one, arguably only one slice of the actual cyber incidents that um, we have seen so far and that we're likely to see. What about all the rest of international law? So now the second iteration of the Talon Manual came out, Talon 2.0, I believe this year it came out. Um, and then that has, um, I mean, it tripled in size, um, but it also covers all the other areas, a lot of other areas of international law uh, below this armed conflict threshold. So I think of the top of my head, my first reaction would be that it's been unduly skewed towards this whole war issue, whereas there is a lot of I think the interesting activities and that the, in, the activities that have given governments a lot of headache in terms of how to respond are actually just below that or in the peacetime regime where we sort of, we have the first um, effort to figure out how does international law apply to that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just, just maybe to add, um, maybe two comments. Uh, no, um, just, just to add the, um, you, you can think of it in, in terms of a ladder of escalation. Um, so international law, um, well this, this area of international law knows first of all situations where you're clearly below this threshold of, the, of, of armed conflict. So you have a cyber action that uh, violates the, the political interest of, a, of another country, uh, maybe as a violation even of sovereignty, um, but it's, it's clearly, it, you know, that, that it's clearly not um, causing any physical damage. It's not uh, causing anybody to die. It, it doesn't have any tangible economic impact. Um, uh, let's say it's, it's, it's something that is influencing a political debate in the country. It's a violation of sovereignty, no question. But it's, it's, it, it falls way below uh, the threshold of, of violence. Um, so for those uh, situations, uh, you have um, a number of, of uh, ways to address, uh, to address them under international law. Uh, chapter 6 of the, uh, of the UN Charter actually lists many of them. Um, and this goes from simple things such as mediation, negotiation, and goes all the way to, to uh, non-forceable countermeasures, um, which can include um, also the imposition of sanctions. And there's even a whole body of international law that, that governs all of these, um, these measures. And then you get into a situation where you have an act that, that goes beyond um, um, something that is clearly peaceful, um, but, um, but may not be in our, a, a, a full-fledged armed attack. So that's a use of force under, on, in the meaning of Article 2.4 of the, of the Charter, but it's, it's not the, the all barrels open, no holds barred attack, uh, armed attack. Um, um, and and the, there's a question how you, how you respond to, to these kinds of uses of, of force um, that, that, that don't constitute a, an armed attack. And again, you're probably still Actually, um, in, in many instances, you'll still be in the realm of, of uh, Chapter 6 and non-forcible countermeasures. And, and only the, the at the extreme end do you actually get to the issue of, of an armed attack and the, the, the law on armed conflict um, and the applicability of the Geneva Convention and the principles of humanitarian law and so on and so on. So actually, most of the, the, the interesting real-life questions that we're in um, are, are way below this, this very controversial aspect of, of uh, does the law on armed conflicts uh, apply to, to ICT incidents. Um, but even those can be very, very controversial. There's a lot of unease in the international community, uh, for instance, with the idea that a state can respond to an ICT incident that does clearly fall below this threshold of armed conflict but the state may still uh, impose uh, non-forcible countermeasures. Um, there's a lot of unease with that idea, and um, it, it, I think we'll take a little bit more discussion to, to explore this, this further. What is interesting, and this is where Jane's 
comment comes in is that all of this is, of course, tied to real life existing conflicts. Um, cyber incidents don't spring from from the from empty air. Um, they do they they typically do uh, reflect uh, pre-existing uh, tensions uh, in, in in other areas. Um, and if you want to just think about it in very simple terms, um, if if I have a, a a substantial cyber incident that affects a German uh, an IT system in Germany, and I suspect that it's coming from the Netherlands, then what I'll do is I'll call my colleague in the Netherlands and say, hey, we're having a problem. Are you having the same problem? And so far, the answer has always been, yeah, what do we do about it? Um, so, um, and there's, there's no danger of escalation. Um, it might be different, for instance, if you had an incident uh, between two countries that uh, already have pre-existing conflicts that are I don't know, have, have uh, issues with each other over the border delineation or treatment of ethnic minorities or over um, uh, sharing of, of natural resources, um, you know, any, any number of things. If you have these pre-existing tensions and then you add a cyber incident to that, that's where the danger is, the potential, uh, the potential of danger is. And that's actually, I think, where the regional organizations come into play and they, they, they can play a very, very important de-escalatory role. And this is where I think Dennis is contribution, I think we're, we're right, the, right on the mark. I, I, I just think on this point, it's fair to say, of the 193 members of the United Nations, no two of them are approaching this question in the same way. I mean, it is, governments are really nowhere um, when it comes to organizing their thinking. And now that might be harsh, you know, but initially NATO was trying to come to grips with whether or not a major cyber attack on one reached the level of an Article 5 engagement of the other members. They've since come to that, but without the definition of what that cyber attack would constitute. Would it, would it constitute taking down 25% of your electrical grid? 50%? You know, where is the line? It's not clear at all. And I think this, this, is, this is not, I think to Carson's point, a th just a theoretical problem. I mean, this is a very real problem. Estonia was dealing with a very real problem. Ukraine, Georgia, there have been other incidents where, where countries have been really trying to grapple with what is happening. And the really interesting um, challenge, I think, is trying to understand who has the capability to respond. In the United States, for example, when I was at the Department of Homeland Security, I had a number of conversations with private sector agents or, or companies who said, if only we knew what the government knew, we could protect ourselves. If only we knew what NSA knew, we could protect ourselves. As if NSA had the corner on the market uh, of information and security in, in cyberspace. And I would point out to them how big, you know, NSA is responsible for protecting the dot mill network in the US. How big do you think that network is? Well, let's say it's the size of this cookie. How big is .gov compared to .mil? Let's say it's the size of this chair. How big is .com compared to .gov? And, and imagine the size of the IPv6 world. Where does the information capacity um, and capacity rely, reside when it comes to responding to attacks in cyberspace? But we have no framework, no, no architecture around the assignment of responsibilities in responding to attacks in cyberspace. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'd just like to comment on, you say uh, there's, there's no country has the same definitions. I think that's one part of it. Also, between different communities, we lack definitions. One of, one of the most interesting and fairly shocking experiences of my life was in the run-up to the GGE where I did a conference in, uh, in Geneva, Dunedir, in one of the pre-conferences where I was on a technology panel, which in itself is funny because I'm not a technologist, but I was there anyway. And uh, the diplomats were in the room, the technologists were at the podium, and we were talking, and uh, it took a good 15 minutes when the penny dropped on both sides where they said, hang on, if we talk about security, we mean something very, very different. Because these were all national security oriented uh, diplomats said we're thinking of international security, national security, that was their realm. The other ones, the technologists were thinking about information security, they were thinking about network security, etc. And there is a part where these two link, obviously, so that in the end became the focus of the debate, which was good, but 
that was fairly shocking to see how widespread that feeling on both sides of the aisle was after, what, what do you say, Carsten, by then? 15, 25 years of, of talking? So that's, that's where we were at that point with these diplomats. So that is, that is something to talk about Babylonian. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's more Babels than one. But. And so, and, and that actually, that's that's part of what we what we what we uh, argue in the paper as well is is, in fact, when we're talking about these issues, we're not talking about the same issues. And so, having a grid, not necessarily a strict framework, because we'll never have like a clear definition of all the of all the terms, but having a clear understanding of well, this is this is where we're talking about this is what we talk about where we're talking about security. There's international security, there's national security, there's network security, there's information security. And having the, uh, the ability to compare policies across these realms would be an incredibly useful tool for making sure that actually discussions are productive. Um, in, if you think about, you said before um, that uh, it would be useful to have discussions in the, with, with like-minded states. But the problem if you do that is that uh, what happens in my group of friends is, uh, the people who are left-wing talk to each other, the people to, who are right-wing talk to each other, and then there's polarization. At what point does the discussion of like-minded state produce the same thing with the de basic definitions, which, which is that the like-minded states, uh, group one, produce a def somewhat one definition of cybersecurity, and the like-minded states, group two, group two, produces another one, and then the definitions are incompatible. And so I think that it's, it's having, having uh, uh, a common basis, not necessarily forcing governments to use the right term, because that, that, that will not happen, but, uh, but having an external analysis of, well, this is, a, this is a structure, this is what we mean about international security, this policy lies here. That would be incredibly important and interesting to understand what we're talking about. No, no very much, because one, one element is, um, is, is, it's not a zero-sum game, so you can have like-minded conversation and you need to have combinations, that's one. The other thing is I'm very much for, in the report we talked about, I also talked about sanitizing the concept of security, doing basically what you do. You need to sort of stretch out and say, okay, what is national security? What is international security? What is, uh, uh, what is, what is uh, internet security? And you need to sort of get an idea because that's also a way to sort of flash out, so what should be dealt with by the diplomats, by the military? What should be dealt with by uh, civilian structures, what should be dealt with, and obviously these things interact because one of, uh, one of, one of the core, and, and that also connects to your point actually about, uh, about internet fragmentation, because internet fragmentation, if you, if you sort of par it with, with a, a reasoning like that, becomes more or less troubling from, from a certain view of, uh, of security, depending on what it is. Um, uh, some, some forms of internet fragmentation are vastly, uh, uh, vastly dangerous for everyone and then constitute international security. Other ones are far more in the realm of sovereignty and where you say, okay, we may not like what is going on here, but maybe this is something that is, yeah, we also have allowances for ourselves. And that's a different conversation to have. And it's, it's a layered conversation. Full agreement. Um, just, um one point on, on definitions. Um, I think it's important to realize that there are different definitions uh, out there and different understandings of concepts. And I think, uh, Dennis, the, the, the Unidir seminar that you, you referred to actually arrived at that conclusion and then it was a very fruitful discussion afterwards. Um, I think if we had tried then to actually arrive at a joint definition of various terms, we probably would still be meeting in that meeting room in Geneva. Um, this is actually one thing we, we did in the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, where we just said, okay, there are 54 participating states, and they all have their own sets of definitions. Rather than, in, in our work on ICT use, uh, rather than try and, and come to joint definitions, uh, we'll compile those and we'll put them next to each other. And so if, if the colleague from Azerbaijan talks about uh, um, information security, we'll look it up, what does it mean in the Azerbaijani definition, and if the colleague from, from Georgia talks about it, the colleague from the Netherlands talks about it, uh, we'll just look it up and we know what is meant by this. Um, that has actually been proven tremendously helpful and has, has spared us a horrible discussion on, on definitions, which is um, one of the ways diplomats bury issues if they don't want to discuss them. So yes. on, uh, I'll give you like one last point and yeah, then yeah. I'll ask the audience. Yeah, <laughs> 
I, I totally agree, because if you see in the UNGG, for example, the 2015 report, where we talk about critical infrastructure, is probably one of the, in the same basket, because every country means something different, what they count in or out, et cetera. Still, it's a useful concept, and the same could be applied for, for trying to flesh out a little bit more what kind of sec uh, security concepts there are without necessarily having to define it in, in a paper. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so sorry that I stopped you. I kind of wanted, because we are 10 minutes uh, till the end, and I wanted to see whether there's any questions from the audience. That, if so, please go up to the mic and introduce yourself. Um, and then if, if we have time, I kind of wanted to touch on sort of the questions of attribution a little bit as well, but I'm not sure we'll have time. And sort of I'll try to get over the, 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 the active defense comments here. Yeah, go ahead. There's a side here, the side, side Manisha. Uh, either Hugo or Kirsten, you could answer this question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, this is Sai Manish. Uh, I write for Business Standard. Just had a question on what uh, Hugo spoke. Uh, uh, you know, you have a framework, but how do you ensure that you uh, detect nations? No nation is going to ever say that, yes, I attack. So do you have a framework by which you can actually detect nations that say, nation X attack nation Y? For instance, we sh uh, saw during Estonia, you know, the Estonians believe the Russians attacked them, but they're not sure. Similarly, in 2003, the Americans believe the Chinese attacked them, but they're not sure. So uh, any such mechanism in there? Thanks. He asked my attribution question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, um, I, I, was, I was asking a question this morning to the previous panel, and I, I said, uh, someone, someone said in, re, uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, you always have to uh, make a difference between the attack and the attacker. Uh, so, and how you deal with the attack uh, is very different uh, from what, how you deal with the attacker. So there are some things, there are many things in fact, that we can do without short of having to say, it was this person or it was this country. Uh, as far as enforcement go, uh, goes, I'm not sure that we're gonna have uh, any time in the near future a binding international treaty uh, forbidding states to do uh, certain things uh, on cyberspace. It might be desirable. It might be something that uh, several people in this panel want to do. Uh, I think we would come to a violent agreement uh, in saying that it won't happen in the next couple of years. And so uh, as far as uh, hard enforcement mechanisms go, I think uh, we have to just find other ways uh, to do than that. Do you want to go? I think. Him first, and then you. <coughs> Professor S.S. Bhakri from Institute of UN and UNESCO Studies. Well, my question pertains to, to an event which happened in mid-1970s. You know, one Israeli plane was hijacked by ID means forces in Uganda and grounded at Entebbe Airport near Kampala. And on 4th of July, 1976, the Israelis rescued that uh, aeroplane, the passengers, crew, everything, and took them safely back to Tel Aviv. The act was hailed by the then Prime Minister of New Zealand as the most daring act, a feat of terrific um, skill happened in 20th century. So will you, will you please call it also? an act of uh, cyber security, cyber rescue, in the history of civil aviation. Such an act never happened, I think, in the 20th century, in the long <laughs> hundred years. So how you comment on this? So was it the rescue also a study or a sort of a duke sex machina in cyber security? Thank you. Well, I think this concept of cyber rescue is an interesting one. Um, I, I haven't heard it talked about a lot, actually. Uh, but I think one of the things that would, would drive any uh, consideration of this very interesting question is what, what President Thomas Ilvish calls the Westphalianization of the Internet, which is the assertion of national authorities over cyberspace increasingly. I think it's unmistakable. Alex Klimberg talked about it. Uh, earlier today, um, and so the question is, will we see more national action under the heading of so-called cyber rescue 
uh, or interventions for national defense purposes or national interest purposes? I think the answer is yes. And madam, do you want to go? Uh, thank you. My name is Analia from Argentina, uh, lawyer. Um, so my question is, uh, if before uh, the territory was the land, was the air, was the, was the sea or was the airspace, it was clear that it was a national intervention without any, any, any discussion. However, now uh, in the digital system, um, uh, the territory is the private infrastructure. So in this sense, my question is, who is the role of the private sector uh, with the relationship with the states? Uh, should be an ally, should be even a soldier, or perhaps a public-private uh, partnership could be a solution, at least in a national level, to then start thinking about an international one. So my question is perhaps for Shane, but for all the others, I would be grateful. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you I'll just offer a quick two cents on this. Um, working with the private sector is something that, that mayors and governors do, uh, provincial leaders do, local leaders do, every single day. Mm -hmm. This is new ground for the international community. We don't have a lot of models. We do have the multi-stakeholder model uh, in ICANN. We do have the multi-stakeholder model of the management of the internet itself. Um, but this is brand new ground. Go ahead. And to add, to add to that, one of the interesting things about the internet is that the beating heart of the internet, the core protocols themselves, are not territorial, they're not sovereign. The way IP functions is not territorial, the way border... So bits and pieces of the physical infrastructure, yes, they're territorial, but the, but the, but, but the core protocols themselves do not necessarily have a sovereignty or, or a territory. So that's also a new thing to deal with. I'll just add that there's, there's also a difficulty there because uh, the, the, the the voices, the, the stakeholders who have voices in the multi-stakeholder model uh, are often the ones who are able to fix the issues, right? We want, we want those stakeholders to, to, have the to have a voice to fix the issue. In a democracy, it's a bit different. We want, it, it's, not a, it's not a who can solve this issue, it's who should solve this issue. And uh, usually we tend to say, well, everybody should have a voice. And so there, there might be a mismatch there. I mean, it's, it's hard to understand how such a model could really work at a global level uh, with this incentive problem. Yeah, and I think also before I turn it over to Mr. Painter, I think it's also the, from a Microsoft perspective, um, you know, you have different players in, in, in the tech sector. So when you, you ask the question of, should it, you know, should there be a soldier? Or uh, I think you have or, uh, companies out there who produce offensive weapons in cyberspace. And I think you have companies like Microsoft, but probably like others that are big global players that are committed to not engaging in that type of behavior. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, there will be a balance and you know companies will decide. Mr. Painter. So I, I just want to throw out something on the attribution question for the panel to react to. Uh, attribution always seems to be this hanging point and it's difficult to respond because people don't can't attribute the actor. But you can often attribute the, um, the territory, even with people using proxy servers and other things, you can often find where something's coming from. You don't know who's doing it necessarily, especially in the short run. So, so what do you think of a proposal that would say, if you see malicious activity coming from a territory, and you go to that political territory, to that government, and you say, look, either you do something about this, you know, whatever you need to do, do something about this. We don't really care who it is do something to mitigate this, and if they don't do it, either because they're unwilling or unable to do it, uh, then that gives you uh, the uh, grounds to take action yourself if you have to. What do you think of that concept and what are the pros and cons of that? Mm -hmm. uh, to get around the attribution issue. <coughs> I think it's very interesting. I think uh, Packet Clearinghouse actually uh, introduced such a norm. I think they called it the hostile packet norm, which is exactly about this because it would give countries um, a possibility to distanciate fr from them, but they would still have to act. So it would, it would, it would get you something, um, but it was less about finger pointing. So it's, I think it could be a useful mean. But in the end, uh, as yesterday was discussed as well, in the end, it's not just about uh, attribution, but it's also about sort of the legitimacy of what's happening. And I think you yourself said, if if we do not deter in any way, that is creating a norm as well. So. 
so I think it's a, it's a very good thing to have it, but it does not preclude the fact that we still have political legitimacy problems that can also de-escalate -escal like this. So, so, that. so I think this raises the question of, uh, we need a new dynamic and a new approach to responsabilization. Uh, the assignment of responsibility, where should it lie? How do we distribute responsibility and consequently, how do we distribute liability? Um, there are a number of laws, for example, that protect uh, information, uh, information at rest. Uh, you know, we rely on diplomatic channels. We also have law enforcement cooperative channels that we can use. But I think, Chris, um, back to the, you know, what are the issues that are raised? Really, this is what is the role of the private sector in an environment like this? Um, and, and how far can national laws reach and how far can international cooperation reach as well? Thank you. I think with that, I will ask whether anyone on the panel wants to have like a last round of comments, points they want to make to summarize the discussion in the seven seconds that we have left. <laughs> I'll, I'll pause. <laughs> that's, that's like asking me at first, please present the general challenges of war and peace in the digital age, right? Yeah, exactly. So we've come full circle. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.